Hey everybody, this is Carissa and I'm here with Jessica Nordell. Um, she is calling in from Minneapolis and um, her recent book, The End of Bias, uh, came out, I think, is it was it last year or this year? Yeah. Or this year? Uh, it was last fall, the hardcover came out. Um, you're a science writer, you're a poet, you're also a comedy writer. Um, don't you have like a degree in physics from <laughs> from... Wait, will you tell me, will you give me like a really quick bio of all the things that you've done in like 11 words? 11 words. Um, I would like, it's like a haiku of, of my CV. So yeah, I started out in science. I studied physics as an undergrad and I started out at MIT, um, which I was able, was like really excited to get to revisit in the book. I have a chapter about MIT and some of the approaches MIT has taken to try to improve diversity. Um, yeah. And so I studied physics as an undergrad and, that, but I always loved writing. And so I started writing after I graduated and had lots of different writing jobs in public radio and magazines and freelancing. And over time kind of merged the science and the writing passion, um, and started doing kind of science writing journalism. And along the way, I also studied poetry and did a master's degree in poetry. So uh, yeah, an eclectic background, I would you say. Also, you also have a degree in fine art too, right? So I, along the way, I also, yeah, I studied for a year at art school. Uh, yeah, so yeah, very eclectic. I mean, I think that people don't often associate science and art, but I think the scientific method, um, or I think that they're so intertwined and and problem solving skills and I think like and creativity yeah oh yeah 100% um there was something that I think I heard and I can't remember if it was in the book or not but it was how you introduce both of your parents um and you have two specific labels for both of your parents um is this ringing a bell at all you have a surfer parent and a conscientious objector parent and I found yes. myself, I thought that this was a really amazing illustration of implicit bias. Can you tell a little bit of a so. story? Or would you have a story that goes along with that? Oh, um, well, I'm curious what your, what, how you, I'm curious about your, um, your sense of implicit bias in those descriptions. Well, I was just like, oh, her dad's a surfer. Oh, interesting. Uh, and yeah, so my mom was the surfer. It was really difficult for me. And then also like their political leanings, it was really difficult for me to um, adjust my associations with their sexes, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, and I think in a way I've thought maybe one of my interests in kind of like undoing gender stereotypes comes from the fact that I, I come from this family where the sort of stereotypical gender norms were somewhat switched. Like my mom is a lifelong Republican, very conservative politically. My dad is a lifelong Democrat, very liberal. Um, my mom was a surfer. My dad is was like this peace loving, conscientious objector. And my mom is definitely like the dominant character in our household growing up. Um, and my dad, I would say, took on more of kind of the nurturing role. So maybe that's, maybe if I think back to it, maybe that's where like some of my, questioning of gender stereotypes comes from what it so uh, th something that I'd like to start off asking is typically about like early exposure um to kind of what you are interested in and what you kind of choose to do and I was wondering if anyone what kind of your when you knew because I mean it's tricky with you because you have such a an eclectic field of research um but I feel like a lot of times or I guess I should say, I feel like I'm an artist because my mother wanted to be an artist and her mother wanted to be an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and I was exposed to it at a young age or it was just always assumed because I was sensitive that I would go into the arts. Do you have a similar sort of origin story of how how you sort of became interested? This is sort of in a follow-up question too, um, thinking about your parents. You know, I think... My, I definitely have an origin story about becoming interested in science. Um, I had some amazing math and chemistry teachers in high school. And <clears throat> I had this chemistry teacher who sort of stopped teaching part of the way through the semester and just had us 
teach ourselves the quantum model. And I thought it was like so fascinating and mind blowing and like unlike anything I'd ever discovered before that I just got really interested in in science, in physics and chemistry. Um, and then with writing, I mean, I don't really, I, I don't think my influences were so much from my parents as like just things that I uncovered myself. I remember being 14 and reading in a college alumni magazine, some excerpts from Adrienne Rich's book, Atlas of a Difficult World, which had just come out. It was like 1991. And I was like, what is this? I just hadn't, I, my, there's no one who's a poet in my family. I had, I hadn't really encountered much poetry, but something about the way the, the words worked together and created this like emotional experience in me was just, it, it was just like mind boggling. And so that, that's what made me interested in poetry, which I think led to just bro broadly, you know, more of an interest in language in writing in, you know, using language as a medium. Uh, when you when you went to that year at art school, what was your medium? Um, screen printing. Interesting. Um, but I did a little bit of video, film and video too. And in fact, I did some film and video where I was sort of trying to merge language and image. And I did a project about prayer um, using Hebrew prayer as kind of this, um, I don't know, almost like painterly kind of, uh, component because it it kind of, I didn't understand Hebrew. So I used the language to kind of just like wash over um, the film. I think that there was a time that you, um, you started publishing under a different name. Mm -hmm. um, was it JD? Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the circumstances around why you started publishing as JD? Because I think it's a really interesting really, really interesting, fascinating, like sort of firsthand account um, and could kind of enter us into the end of bias. Yeah, you know, I was starting out as a journalist and I was writing for a lot of kind of regional and local publications. And I started wanting to pitch national magazines and newspapers. And so I started sending out queries as you do in journalism and I didn't know anybody. I, I was just like a completely random person <laughs> sending out pitches and I wasn't getting a response. Even though I thought the pitches were like pretty interesting, um, I wasn't hearing back. And then I had this one particular essay that was timed to something happening in culture. So there was like a kind of a narrow window during which it would be relevant. And I wasn't hearing back from editors. And so I kind of had this like moment of desperation where I was like, well, I'll try sending it out under another name and see if that makes a difference. I did not expect this was going to work. I was just like, I don't know what else to try. I'll try, you know, throw it, throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And so I, I made a new email account and I sent out the same pitch, but as JD Nordell instead of Jessica thinking, okay, well, maybe if it has kind of a masculine sound, maybe, maybe people will respond differently. And the piece was accepted within a couple hours. Same piece, same same pitch, same same editors actually. Um, and I was like, I couldn't believe it. I remember just like standing up from my computer, like, did that just really happen? And yeah, it was shocking. Um, you, did you ever um, like later? Did you ever get how long? Well, first of all, how long did you um, submit things under JD Nordell? A couple of years. And then yeah. did you ever, um, did you ever, did anyone ever like catch you or were there any sort of awkward moments when um, people maybe spoke to you on the phone or used um, pronouns incorrectly or, I mean, there's so many ways Completely. that gender shows up. Yeah, well, I had many awkward interactions um, because I still, I mean, I, I'm Jessica. My friends know me as Jessica, like they did then. And so, yeah, I remember having a back and forth with an editor where I was pitching the story as JD, signing emails as JD. And then the editor called me and like, I, I didn't like remember, you know, I was like, oh, the, you know, hi, this is Jessica. And she was like, I'm looking for JD. I, she was very surprised to hear my voice. She expected, I think she expected a man's voice. And um, yeah, so I, I had awkward experiences and and ultimately it just felt, 
I, I think ultimately I just came to feel like if I can't, if, if I can't be in the world as, as I am, as I, as I feel I am, then I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I just, I, I ended up reverting back to um, Jessica and kind of letting the chips fall. And I mean, there probably are, you know, opportunities that haven't landed because, you know, because I'm a woman and editors know I'm a woman, but I, I, I couldn't do both. Were you ever able to kind of talk to anybody or not, not confront, but kind of unpack um, if they had those biases or? I didn't, I never talked to the editors about this. I would say the closest that I got was talking to Ben Barris a lot, um, who is one of the subjects that I talk about yeah, in my book, who is. Ben. Yeah. So, so Ben Barris is, was sadly passed away a few years ago, was an incredible, like towering figure, um, a neurobiologist uh, at Stanford who did a lot of groundbreaking research. And I became aware of him because he published an essay around the time that I was pitching as JD, he published an essay in nature where he described his experience being a transgender scientist. Um, and the ways that he was treated completely differently after his transition. Um, he described things like, you know, not being interrupted in meetings and being taken more seriously. He said, I've had the thought a million times I'm taken more seriously. There was even a scientist who was overheard saying at a conference, um, Ben gave a, great gave, gave a great presentation today, but of course his work is so much better than his sister's. It's, yeah. And so I actually, I mean, it's, yeah, completely out in the open. Um, so I had, I had the opportunity inter to interview him several times about his experience. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I think that's pretty early on in the book. And I think I was really like blown away by how too. I think he's a special situation because he was able also to pass, um, I think, which, which not, I mean, isn't, isn't necessary like his experience I think is just really unique and cool and uh, yeah it's not a universal experience I think for for trans men at all um there's a book by Kristen Schilt called Just One of the Guys that actually looks at I think the experience of 50 different trans men and their experience at work and yeah, I mean, it varies a lot. It varies by race. It varies by stature, height. You know, there are all these different things. And yeah, Ben, I think for a variety of reasons, like specifically, um, yeah, he said that people who did not know he was trans treated him completely differently. Uh, so you kind of, um, you break down the end of bias, a beginning into three different parts. And I think that this is kind of, I mean, a monumental thing to try to tackle how I mean how deep bias is um maybe we should start a by defining the three sections but also if you could define what you mean by bias and I mean implicit bias versus unrecognized bias or I mean there are a bunch of different ways to think about it and I was wondering if um you could speak to those and maybe just give us some definitions yeah absolutely so I'll I'll describe kind of unconscious bias and then then I'll describe how it's a bit of a troubled um definition but uh I guess that that's kind of like an academic approach right I'll tell you kind of so, a and then I'll then I'll explain why that's not totally the full story um so so the kind of classic idea of unconscious bias is basically that we live in a culture that teaches us categories of people. And as we're learning those categories, we start to also absorb stereotypes and associations and beliefs and ideas about all those categories. Um, cultural knowledge, we absorb cultural knowledge about those categories. And then when we encounter someone or we find ourselves in a situation that we recognize as belonging to one of those categories, then all of that information that was stored in our memory, this kind of like, you know, all these cultural stereotypes that we've stored in our memory start to activate and they start to influence how we react and how we feel 
and what our what we expect and what we're going to predict from the interaction and all of these kinds of things. And ultimately, it, they can affect our behavior. So that's kind of what we think of as unconscious bias, like all of this stored, these stored kind of cultural ideas starting to influence our behavior spontaneously, automatically, you know, in a way that maybe conflicts with our values. The reason that I, I actually prefer to use the term unexamined bias because there's another kind of body of research that suggests that maybe that stored information is what we actually believe. And maybe it's not in conflict with our beliefs, but maybe it's actually an expression of our deep but unexamined beliefs. Ooh. And so, yeah, I think that's really interesting because when I, like when I think about internalized sexism and the way that I sometimes respond to women differently than I respond to men in a spontaneous way, when I've really interrogated it, I think, I think there are some harmful beliefs that I've absorbed, that I hold, that I'm working to kind of uproot, but they're there, you know, they're there. They're not just I feel like they're not just sort of cultural associations that are kind of living in my head. I feel like they're a little more deeply rooted. So, so there's, there's an accountability in the unexamined bias that that feels like a, it also is something you, you want to acknowledge. Totally. There's accountability and there's also action because if something is unexamined, then the next step is to examine it. It kind of like, you know, prompts some action, prompts some, some a next step, something active. Because if if you we think about it as unconscious bias, it it maybe sounds it, it's not quite as clear what what we should do about it. But if something is unexamined, then we can examine it, and that's a really important first step. Who is the scientist at Harvard that. who's working on the sort of implicit bias studies where you can go on to like the Harvard website and? Um, sort of test yourself and your um, yeah. unexamined biases uh, and at times. Yeah, so yeah, so that's um, Mazarin Banaji. She's part of, I think she started Project Implicit, which uh, she and Anthony Greenwald and I think Brian Nosek also um, developed the implicit association test where, yeah, you can go online and you can kind of, it tests basically how quickly you respond to certain groupings of words and depending on, your response time, it purportedly sort of uncovers your implicit associations about those groups. Um, yeah. Has this also been sort of examined or re trying to be reevaluated the implications of it recently? Am I wrong? Yeah. I mean, the implicit association test is a little, uh, there's some challenges, there's some problems with it. I mean, it originally people thought, oh, this is like the big reveal, like this is going to be, you know, teach us ex how our implicit bias affects our behavior and what's really going on and kind of the, you know, the shadow part of our minds. But there are a couple of problems with the implicit association test. Um, one is that it doesn't really actually predict behavior very closely. And so you could have, you could, on the test, you could appear to have really a lot of implicit biases, but then your actual behavior doesn't necessarily reflect that or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And the other kind of big challenge with it is it has low test retest reliability. So like if I take the test on Saturday and then I take the test on Sunday, I might get different responses. And so that kind of makes the test itself feel a little questionable, but I think it's actually really useful as like a, as a kind of broad look at a, a culture, like an entire society's biases. Cause you do see trends um, in different parts of the world. And I think that that's maybe a, the most useful way of, of using it. Maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, the two parts of the brain, the, um, the sort of thinking fast and thinking slow and where our sort of unexamined bias lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the kind of like the kind of classic um, notion of unconscious bias that I was talking about before really kind of separates um, our belief system from our associations. And this is hopefully not getting too much in the weeds, but the belief system would be attached to more 
um, deliberate, kind of conscious, thoughtful ways of thinking. Um, and the associations would be attached to more kind of automatic ways of thinking. Um, we've there's often been this idea, or there's um, classically been this idea that there there's a dual process notion of the brain. There are like these two different processes: the kind of more slow, deliberate, and the more automatic or fast. Um, although I again to complicate things, hopefully this doesn't complicate it too much. But I remember talking to someone who wrote the book on dual process theory, and he said. I think he started it like dual process theory is dead, long live dual process theory, because actually that idea that there are just two separate kinds of processes is also an oversimplification. There are actually maybe multiple different kinds of processes. And anything that we do could be a combination of some automatic and some deliberate processes. And so that's, I think, also why the idea of unconscious bias just being this spontaneous automatic kind of response is not really the full picture because I think there are multiple different things going on when we anytime we respond to another person there might be spontaneous automatic responses that are based on cultural stereotypes but there might also be some actual beliefs some thoughts some values that are also influencing that reaction super compl complicated like everything yeah basically. There was, um, I think, another study in the book uh, kind of earlier on that talks about sort of the beginnings of bias. And apparently there were a bunch of um, experiments done by uh, social psychologists in schools um, on, on the topic of sort of understanding where biases sort of begin in childhood and how they kind of, how we start to categorize things. And it made me think of... Um, against empathy and I think it's just babies by Paul Bloom um where he talks a lot about sort of the innate biases and in, in in babies and the studies that you referenced start at like three and four years of age um is there is there a way you could talk about sort of early our early understandings of how um category categorization um starts to kind of push these biases into um our understandings of the world Absolutely. There's some really amazing research by a psychologist named Becky Bigler, who was really curious about how bias emerges in children. Because we know that kids, really young kids, start to um, favor some groups over other groups. And she was curious about like, what are the conditions in our culture that actually either promote that or diminish that? And so she did some really interesting and like somewhat controversial studies with children where she went into schools and like her sort of famous body of work involved dividing kids into groups and having some like in a summer school, she would have half of the kids in the summer school in her experimental group and half in the control group. And all of the kids would either get blue shirts or yellow shirts. And in the control group, the teachers would give the kids these shirts and they would wear them every day, but they would never talk about them or mention them or do anything with the shirt colors. But in the experimental group, she had the teachers constantly talk about shirt colors. So she would say like, line up yellows and blues or the teacher would say, okay, all the blues put their artwork on this wall and all the yellows put their artwork on this wall. And they would, the teachers would constantly like reinforce the idea of these groups that the kids now belonged to. And she did this with lots of different groups. She did it with boys and girls. Um, and what she found is that in the classrooms where the teachers were constantly reinforcing this idea that the kids were in a particular group, those kids started to develop stereotypes about their own group and about other groups. So like in the yellow and blue groups, those kids started to develop this, um, this uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They started to develop something called in-group favoritism where they just saw their own group as really great and the other group is, as not as good. What do you think? Oh, sorry. I'll let you finish. No, 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 no. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was curious if you had any opinions on, on from an evolutionary standpoint, like what the advantages would have been um, to in-group fav favoritism, or if you had an opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not um, an evolutionary psychologist, but, you know, I think in general, in, you know, in a harsh world, um, knowing who's in your tribe, who's in your group, and who you can trust um, would certainly be helpful, you know. Uh, kinship groups are some of the earliest, you know, in groups that, that we know about and, you know, be no, yeah. Knowing who you can trust, who's, who's going to, who, who's not going to attack you, you know, who's, who you're going to be able to rely on, I think is, is probably helpful um, in, you know, in a world where uh, there are a variety of threats. So I think it's, it, yeah, it, my guess is it emerged as a response to threat. Um, but I think like the, also not to continue on from where you were talking about, but the, um, how I was surprised at how rapidly, um, the sort of associations when they were broken down into gender, uh, how rapidly, um, the, the children took on the stereotypes of that gender. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are really interesting studies that look at, um, the way that emphasizing gender categories then causes children to start to believe more in gender stereotypes, believe that, you know, girls are more likely to um, be interested in house cleaning and things like that. And you know, boys are more adventurous or more, you know, more, um, you know, more rough and tumble. I'm thinking of another really fascinating study that looked at the influence of television Ooh. in a Canadian, um, village in the 70s so this village hadn't it, it didn't have television even though all of the surrounding villages had television and it was just like a fluke of geography there was um because of the way the mountains were positioned the signal didn't get through and mm -hmm. so there was like this lone village in in british columbia that didn't have television until the 70s and once uh it was announced that television was coming some researchers like raced to the town to try to do a lot of measurements so they could see what the impact of television was. And what they found was that two years after the introduction of television, the children in this town did more gender stereotyping. Like they were more likely to say men should be presidents and women should be librarians and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the information that kids are getting about who belongs to what group and how important those groups are has a huge effect on how kids see themselves and each other. Uh, it it opens up this sort of mind boggling uh, anxiety sort of abyss of like, um, cause we let Margaret, we again, or my daughter has cystic fibrosis. And so we do these treatments and she gets to watch the iPad. Um, and the sort of like top goal during this is to administer the treatment. So basically she has free reign. She can watch whatever she wants on the iPad as long as she like sits through this treatment, um, which I don't know if they did this without iPads. Um, but the stuff that um, she watches is uh, are quite are quite frightening. And I, I, it's sort of like the lesser of two evils. Like, do I... I, I don't know, it's a constant negotiation. I want to have time um, to talk a little bit um, more, but also have you read a bit from the end of your book. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask you just a couple more questions and then we could end with uh, you reading sort of, I feel like the end is really hopeful and has a lot of uh, sort of why this should matter to all of us. So after talking a little bit about kind of what the problem looks like. Um, I was wondering, Jessica, if you could talk a little bit about um, solutions, not to make us, I feel like all of the time right now we we spend um, talking about the problem and it feels like so daunting, um, but the solutions are, it feel very actionable after after reading the book. Yeah, I mean, the my kind of goal in, in writing this book was really to try to uncover how we change, like whether it's possible for people to change and if it's possible for people to change, like how do we actually become more humane and more fair? And how do we treat each other with more compassion and um, life affirming, you know, love? And so, yeah, so so most of the book is really about how 
what what works like what actually causes discrimination to diminish and so there there are a lot of different approaches i mean one that i think is really fascinating and that i try to use in my own life is um something called contact theory and this was an idea that was developed by well it well it was it was um brought to the public by a psychologist named Gordon Alport in the 50s. But I actually found evidence of contact theory being developed by an African-American woman named Juliet Derricott, who was a YWCA employee decades earlier, who actually used this idea and tested it out with college students. So, but she was not credited ever with um, with this theory. So, So the theory is basically that if you bring people together who are equal status and they collaborate on a shared goal, this starts to break down stereotypes. So it's not just getting to know people, but actually working collaboratively with people toward a shared common goal. And there are a lot of examples of this really working. Like there's, um, there was some research about cricket players in India that found that when you put men of different castes on the same team, over time, those men started to behave differently toward men of other castes. Like they would be more likely to nominate someone from a prize if they were from a different caste or want to be friends with someone from a different caste. So that's an approach that actually like works and we could use it. You know, we can use it in a lot of different contexts, I think, in in our present life. I try to use it in my own life a lot. That's that's one solution, but there are many Many others. I could I could go on, or if you want to ask something else, that's fine too. Oh no, actually, that was um, my one of my questions was um, sort of breaking the habit. Actually, can you can you give us maybe another couple sort of um, ways that we can break down these biases? Um, yeah, maybe on a on a more personal sort of like if you aren't because in some ways there's the, about the um, contact theory. It, you it's you kind of have to be put in the situation in some ways. And I don't know, I guess in some ways I think about humans as being inherently, I mean, it depends on how you define lazy, but uh, we'll take sort of shortcuts or um, wouldn't necessarily volunteer to be in a situation of discomfort, I guess, or perceived discomfort. Um, are there ways that, or maybe smaller steps that one could take? Yeah, I mean, I think the first step for any, anyone who wants to examine their own biases and interact with the world in a more humane way or a more reality-based way is to slow down and start to notice those unexamined reactions. And it sounds really simple, but it's actually pretty difficult to do and quite deep work to start to notice, just notice what is coming up into our minds when we're responding to a person in front of us? Um, and I, I oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. An example for me is um, I didn't notice I was doing this until like 10 years ago, where if I was in a dark alley or if I was somewhere in my car, locking my car doors when I would see sort of loitering men or, and I think that this is a huge bias that I think, I think my mother taught me of like trying to keep safe as a, as a woman, mm -hmm. but I think that there are, are lots of different layers on why I might be doing that and what my fear might also be producing in this situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was just the first one that came to my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there might be a situation, like if someone is running down an alley toward you, like holding a knife you know, it's, it's reasonable and it's responsible. To... I mean, <laughs> I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, I think there's so many situations where we make predictions based on ideas and, and stereotypes that we have. And I think the, the more we can really start to see what's happening in our own mind, the more free we are actually to, respond in a way that is more like in line with our values and more, you know, more able to create more love and more compassion in the world. Yeah. So I think so. And that's really mindfulness. That's what it is. I mean, it's really mindfulness of one's own mind. Um, so Jessica, will you, can I invite you to read um, the 
the last couple paragraphs in the book uh, as a closure to our interview? Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that I really realized over the course of working on this project was that me kind of tackling my own biases was not just for the benefit of like people I might be biased against, but it was actually also helping me. And it was really important for me to be able to see the world clearly and like not be subject to like daydreams and hallucinations, which are what I think bias biases are. And so these last couple of paragraphs are about kind of my um, realization about that. I, I want to say too, I think that this is a real strength of the book. I think a lot of the writing on, on, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to um, integrate unconscious or unexamined bias. No worries. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think that there's, and this is something that I like, don't want to admit readily that there's a part of me that needs to have a rationale for why it's important for me and why it's better for my life as well as highlighting the injustice and um, disalignment and values. And it's like a reality that I just, I don't like, but it's there. Um, And I think that you do a really good job of uncovering and talking about why it's important for everyone, not not just people who are affected negatively. And I'll, I'll let you read, sorry. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. And I think, I don't know, I would maybe just question a little bit whether that's a bad thing, because I think, I think actually, if we, if we see our combating, combating our own bias as being for the benefit of someone who's suffering alone, this can really give rise to kind of like a savior mentality, like the idea that I'm doing something for, for you and it and 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 there's not you know there's nothing that i'm yeah, this no. this isn't affecting me at all but i think that i just think it's wrong like i think that we're i think we're like deeply interconnected with each other mm-hmm. and there isn't there isn't one without the other so i i see that as i don't know i guess i just see it as more reflective of what's really going on yeah, no, I really like that. And I, and I agree. I think about this in terms of, um, cal- wait, I should really let you read because uh, <laughs> we're way over time already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, let me, let me um, interrupt myself. And I, cause I really do think it's super important for you. Okay. To this. Um, okay. So this is from toward the end of the book. As I examined and confronted my own biases, my relationship with the world began to change. Friendships grew deeper and richer, both among people with whom I shared many social identities and among those with whom I shared few. Difficult conversations became more manageable. As I became more confident I could repair my relations with others, it became easier to risk venturing into the unfamiliar. When someone across a social difference reached out to me in friendship or trust, I rushed in knowing there was information in that exchange I needed. For much of this project, I struggled with what felt like a paradox, the fact that emphasizing differences carries the risk of entrenching stereotypes and increasing prejudice and discrimination. But downplaying them can generate feelings of invisibility and disrespect. In time, I came to see that the choice was false and impossible. We are all of these. We are similar sharing the need for belonging, fresh air, vegetables, and human connection. We have differences born from our ancestries and bodies and contexts created by people long dead. We are individuals, as particular as the markings of a human iris. We have no patterns, wrote Audre Lorde, for relating across our human differences as equals. The problem I saw is not in seeing difference but in the values and meanings we attach to it. If we can grapple with our biases deeply enough to see one another in all our facets, perhaps we can begin to create the patterns Lord imagined. We might too be able to feel our way into another's experience. This act of imagination, notes the South African scholar Pumla Gobodo Medikizela, is a prelude to caring, a prelude perhaps to love. Gabodo Medikizela 
who served on her country's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, writes that Descartes' famous notion, I think, therefore I am, reflects a sense of individual existence, <clears throat> reflects a sense of individual existence that is independent of others. But in fact, she says, we exist in and through each other. Our humanity depends on our ability to bestow humanity on others. This truth surpasses the business case for ending bias. It strengthens the culture case and underpins the justice case. We end bias for the sake of others and for our own. Who might we become without our illusions and denials? We might become human and trustworthy. We might all become free. That was beautiful. Jessica, thank you so much for doing all of this amazing work um, and for this book of hope um, and reframing. And I think that, I don't know, I, I really enjoyed the read. I thought it was poetic and accessible, interesting, not, not preachy, but also like intensely relatable. And I, I felt really, really, really seen. In it, which is a weird thing to say about a book about the end of bias. Um, <laughs> but I'm really grateful that you took the time to talk to me today. I'll put the link to the book in the show notes. Um, and thank you again. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Do you have anything really quick that um, you're looking forward to in the future that you want to talk about? Hmm. I'm looking forward to, honestly, a expanding these conversations and continuing to have these conversations. I started a newsletter recently where, um, which is just kind of like a playground for me to continue to talk to people about relating to each other in better ways and more humane ways. And so I'm really excited about those conversations. That's one thing I'm really excited about going well, forward. I'll definitely put the link to that too. Thank you so cool. much. Jessica. Take care. Thank you. You too.